This is Harish Murthy from Microlabs. I take this opportunity to welcome all of you uh, to, for today's webinar on the topic beta blockers and ARB combination in hypertension and CVD, the way forward. Uh, we have an eminent speaker today, Dr. Girish Navsundi, who will be talking on the subject. But before that, to chair the session, we have yet another a very senior cardiologist from Bangalore, Dr. Nagraj Desai, who was kindly consented to chair the session today. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Desai to you. Dr. Desai is a fellow of the Indian College of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology, and also the European Society of Cardiology. He is also a fellow of the APSIC and SCAI. Currently, Dr. Desai is the director of Namana Medical Center, Bangalore. He is also a senior visiting consultant at Fortis Hospitals, Bangalore. He is a chairman of the Karnataka Cardiology Academy, adjunct professor of cardiology, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Mysuru. Dr. Desai is a graduate of the MR Medical College and did his medicine from PGMIR and also his DM Cardiology from PGMIR, Chandigarh. He has served at the Ramaya Medical College and Hospitals from 1981 to 2007 and also served at the JSS Medical College, Mysore from 9 to 17 and also is currently an adjunct professor there. Dr. Desai has participated in various national international clinical trials and has published 54 papers. So my privilege to introduce Dr. Desai to you and I hand over the platform to Dr. Desai to take it forward. Thank you. Uh, good evening, friends. Thanks, Harish. Thanks, Microlabs, for providing this opportunity to all of us, this digital platform to share the experiences and also the science content of this today's topic. Indeed, the combination therapies have come a long way in managing our patients, not only just hypertension, but also various other disorders that you already know of, like lipids, like diabetes, and what else you have. Indeed, cardiovascular diseases being as prevalent in our country, and even more when compared to the Western world, we have to be kind of striving hard to control these non-communicable diseases. And the combination therapy provide us uh, with the armamentarium where the compliance issues can be one of the concerns when we manage our patients. Now, combination of uh, beta blockers and uh, ARB in this particular setting, we are examining the bisoprolol and also telmisartan combination for us to make us uh, more uh, smart. We have very smart uh, interventional cardiologist in Dr. Girish Navasundi. He is a director of cardiac cat lab in Apollo Hospital, Banagata Road, Bangalore, and comes with uh, very rich experience in not only in uh, clinical cardiology, but also in interventional cardiology. You name the procedure, he has a number to support his claim for that coveted position in the national scene also. Now, he is also supported by his team, and the details may not be very uh, um, important. Yet, for this particular presentation, I would say that he is one cardiologist who always cares for his patients, and hypertension being one of the domains, one of the main domains of cardiologists, he comes out as uh, a very powerful presentation that I have heard him several times. With those remarks, let's uh, be wiser after listening to Dr. Girish Navasindi. Dr. Navasindi, please. Thank you, respected Dr. Nagaraj Desai, sir, for uh, you know, bringing your wisdom to the platform today, to all the listeners, and kind words towards me, um, as, as usual, sir. I'm grateful. And, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nagaraj Desai, sir, for your kind words and, you know, your wisdom always matters on these platforms, uh, 
It's decades of uh, transition from journey of uh, treatment of hypertension. So it's very important to have your, uh, you know, the final comments and assessment of uh, what we're going to discuss today. I also thank Mr. Harish and Micro Labs today to have brought us today to discuss the topic of hypertension and management with the help of a beta blocker and an ACRB and the best uh, among the two, what we must choose as a combination. Um, towards that, I think I would start my presentation. Okay, I'll be speaking today on beta blocker and angiotensin receptor blocker combination in hypertension as well as cardiovascular disease, the way forward. When you look at it, hypertension is one of the most prevalent risk factor for morbidity and mortality in entire humanity. When you look at the world hypertension population, it's about 1.13 billion people on the planet suffer, suffer from hypertension. 23% in South Asia have hypertension among them, that which accounts to about 258 million. Among them, 200 million are Indians. 21% in the East Asia, if they have hypertension, which amounts to 235 million, 225 million is from China. So these two countries, which contribute to, you know, maybe every two among five people on the planet, about 21 to 23% of them have hypertension. Specifically coming to India, hypertension um, at, is attributed for 57% of all strokes and 24% of all artery disease related deaths. Can you imagine? Hypertension is responsible for 57% of all strokes and 24% of all ischemic heart disease deaths. In the GBD study, on um, people less than 70 years, cardiovascular deaths or total deaths, when you look at it, in India, it was 52%, West just 23%. We are almost double cardiovascular death among people less than 70%. We're almost twice compared to the West. And coming to the hypertension in India, you would realize that onset of hypertension occurs relatively early in life, right from third decade onwards. There is significant rural and urban divide. There's also clustering of multiple risk factors among those hypertensives. They could be obese, uh, diabetic, or disability, already suffering from kidney disease. There's a significant seasonal variations of BP in this continent. Average BP in population has been constantly rising for a period of time. Now, when you look at another uh, important aspect is the um, average heart rate values, what we call beats per minute. Whenever we look at India heart study during their first visit to second visits, you see that the heart rates usually are higher in Indians compared to others. And they're really con re relatively constant between visits. Uh, when you look at the morning heart rate, the average heart rate, evening heart rates, all of them seems to be fairly all right. Towards the evening, slightly more is the heart rate. And uh, coming to the prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in hypertensive patients. Today, when you know hypertension, when we speak about there are two or three neurohormonal mechanisms which are primarily responsible. First is sympathetic, second one in regin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and uh, third is probably we are looking at tone of the vessels where you have either calcium channel blockers uh, which may play a role and the kidney where diuretics would play a role. So when you look at that, the prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in India is something of uh, importance. In this study where Mr. Padmanabhan and team had seen that it showed prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in newly diagnosed hypertensive patients in India to be around 62%. So 62% of the Indian patients, irrespective of other mechanisms, sympathetic overactivity is seen in 62%. And when you treat these people, we realize that in most clinical trials 
in hypertension trials, diabetes trials, and kidney disease trials, you realize to manage hypertension to the goal, you need multiple drugs, not just one drug. The least has been in Alhat, where an average use of drug were two drugs. In hot and accomplish was almost three drugs. And when you come to again diabetic hypertensive populations like renal, indent, invest, accord, uh, UKPDS, you will see that you need at least two and a half to three class of drugs to control the blood pressure. And worst is amongst the kidney disease. MDRD in ASK trials have shown you that you need more than three drugs to control the BP to target uh, among CKD patients. So you need to treat a hypertensive patient easily with two drugs or more. So a single pill strategy to treat hypertension has been the most efficient way and the right way of doing. The single pill uh, strategy is now the preferred strategy for initial two drug combination. And also when three drugs are required, you can still have a single pill three drug combination. Now, when you think of giving two drugs to a person, especially when there is cardiovascular disease involvement, you're always looking at beta blocker because cardiovascular disease, uh, the risk of sudden death and positive remodeling is the highest with bisoprolol. I mean, the beta blockers, and among them, we're looking at bisoprolol, metoprolol, and we will all in carvedilol. So we'll be talking about bisoprolol today. And the other molecule is ARB, uh, AC and ARB. Um, today we'll be talking about ARB, tell me starter. Why bisoprolol has been the number one chosen drug among beta blockers globally. Bisoprolol has a 19.6 fold higher affinity for the beta one receptor than for the beta two. Means this is highly beta one selective blocker. When you look at bisoprolol, if it's 19.6, the you know B2B to beta selective ratio, beta one to beta, sorry, beta two to beta one ratio, it's 19.6 for bisoprolol. For metoprolol is just six, etanolol 5.7, carvedilol very poor, but we know that is its strength, 0 0.6, same for propanolol. And bisoprolol has minimal effects on lipids and glucose metabolism. As patients with hypertension tend to have many comorbidities, including diabetes or prediabetes and dyslipidemia, you do not want a hypertensive medicine to worsen the glycemic control or the lipid parameters. So here you see bisoprolol, initial value after two weeks and after two weeks of placebo versus after two weeks of bisoprolol, 10 milligrams daily, there's absolutely no difference in terms of cholesterol values, in terms of triglycerides, a very, very insignificant glucose, hardly any difference between a bisoprolol and placebo after two weeks. HPA1C again, no great difference between placebo and bisoprolol 10 milligram once daily. So that means it's a metabolically safe drug when there's cluster uh, risk factors. The superior safety and efficacy of bisoprolol is a function of its superior pharmacokinetics than other beta blockers. You know, all the beta blockers act in the same way. They block the beta adrenergic receptor, but then again, pharmacokinetics is also important. When you look at the elimination, plasma elimination half-life is the longest for the bisoprolol. So it has 24 hour sustained smooth beta blocking activity compared to metoprolol where it's only three to four hours, carotidolol and hours. Absorption, more than 90% of the drug gets absorbed. So it gets, it's very predictive. Similar with metoprolol and closely carvedilol. Nebivalol is also very well absorbed. First pass effect, less than 10%. Bioavailability is again the highest, about 90% is bioavailable compared to 50 to 75 for metoprolol and just 25 for carbonylol. So it becomes very predictive in its action. Protein binding, um, about 30%, whereas carbonylol is more than 98%. All these put together help in its better efficacy. When you look at the route of elimination, there are some beta blocker which are 100% liver elimination. 
some are hundred percent renal elimination. When you and bisphosphonates is bang in the middle, fifty percent renal, fifty percent uh, liver. So you can use in any of these patients. Drugs such as metoprolol and carvedilol seems to be predominantly liver eliminated, and drugs such as atenolol and sotolol seem to be predominantly renal excreted drugs. When you look at bisoprolol and pindolol, they seem to be 50-50%, so they're relatively safe in both diseases or either of the diseases. And also bisoprolol has minimal effects on male sexual function. We know as we are having younger patients with hypertension and increased sympathetic activity, beta blockers are ideal drugs for many of these people. But if it leads to sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, the compliance may become lesser or patients would be very uncomfortable or disadvantaged. So when you look at the drugs, the sexual dysfunction probability is highest with carvedilol about 13.5 versus propanolol in about five and adrenolol 3%. But look at bisoprolol, hardly anything. This is documented way back in 1992. Probably this is one of the reasons why this has been used extensively in the Western world. In the BMJ open study, that is BRIGHT trial, which is efficacy and tolerability of beta-1 selective beta blocker bisoprolol. As a first line antihypertensive in Indian patients diagnosed with essential hypertension, it's an open label multi-center observational study. This is the, one of the first studies which was done. Bisoprolol found to be safe and effective in stage one hypertension among Indians. Average dose required is about five milligram per day and target BP was achieved in about 96% of these patients with just five milligrams per day. Study reaffirms bisoprolol as first line drug in the management of hypertension. This was done by none other than Dr. Chanaraya, who is our uh, Bangalore uh, eminent uh, professor and physician. And it really was the first ever study done for bisoprolol in large Indian population. Bisoprolol shows comparable long-acting effects on BP control and a more potent long-acting effects on heart rate reduction as compared to metoprolol uh, CRR. What I would like to tell you is when you want to block sympathetic activity, you want to reduce uh, cardiac output, stroke volume, and also reduce heart. Once you want to reduce the uh, cardiac output, you have to reduce stroke volume and heart rate, both of them. That's how heart benefits. So when you look at beta blockers, bisoprolol and metoprolol, baseline to end of treatment, when you look at these patients, you realize that the blood pressure reduction is almost similar, but the heart rate reduction is much higher with bisoprolol than metoprolol which definitely benefits patients of hypertension with heart failure as well as coronary artery disease. And also when you look at the change in diastolic blood pressure in the last four hours of treatment period from baseline, it is between bisoprolol and metoprolol identical efficacy. So identical efficacy for blood pressure control, but better efficacy for heart rate control with bisoprolol. Another bisomet study where exercise blood pressure and heart rate reduction 24 hours and three hours after drug intake in a hypertensive patients following four weeks of treatment with bisoprolol and metoprolol. In this study, they studied giving a metoprolol or a bisoprolol and asking a person to exercise and see what happens to BP uh, reduction 24 hours and three hours after taking. You realize that compared to uh, metoprolol, bisoprolol consistently reduced the blood pressure, excise induced blood pressure in 90% of the patients versus 66% with metoprolol. Heart rate reduction was seen in 93% better with bisoprolol compared to just 54% of metoprolol. And again, RPP was seen 92% with bisoprolol versus 60% with uh, uh, metoprolol. So this again reaffirms that bisoprolol seems to fare better uh, in the last four hours of uh, 
uh, what do you call the BP control as well as sustained heart rate control. Bisoprolol is the most used beta blocker across the world in stable coronary artery disease. When you look at Europe, excluding UK, bisoprolol is the highest next to the metoprolol succinate, then tartrate, carvedilol, actinolol, nebulol in that sequence. But if you see bisoprolol, it is combined two of them. When you look at Russia and Ukraine, bisoprolol is maximum. It is almost equal to all other beta blockers together. When you look at the Canada, again, it's equivalent to metoprolol uh, and carbidilol. When you look at the Middle East, again, it's equivalent to atenolol and, uh, sorry, carbidilol and metoprolol. In Asia, when you look at it, I think still metoprolol tartrate is one of the long, uh, more used. Bisoprolol is still equally used. So to put it globally, I think bisoprolol is the maximum uh, used beta blocker. Bisoprolol improved long-term outcomes in patients with stable angina. How do you know a drug fares best when you find objective goals to be reduced, such as blood pressure and heart rate, and also the outcomes to be better? Which of these outcomes? Death, MI, hospitalization for reverse revascularization or heart failure. When you look at it, with bisoprolol, the event-free survival was significantly better. Event rates were just 22% in bisoprolol versus 33% among uh, nifidipi. So compared to a calcium channel blocker, beta blockers definitely help. We know that. The 2022 HACC HFSA guidelines for the management of heart failure recommends Guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure to reduce ejection fraction has brought in rapid sequential therapy, not one after the other. It used to be a slow sequential, first beta blocker, then an RNA, MRA, SGD20, but now within four weeks, they want all three steps achieved in four weeks. Up titration to target those has to be done subsequently. So that is the current guideline recommendation that's happening. So when we look at the four drugs that we're having at, at this time, uh, the drugs that we are using are first beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors at the outset, and then early as possible within a day or a week, you start an RNA and then back it up with mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So that's the way quick initiation and quick up titration is the way to go forward for this. And now when you look at the bisoprolol uh, is a well-studied beta blocker in heart failure patients with comorbidities. When you look at the patients, uh, kind of patients that you're treating, you have the CBIS trials, whether it's CBIS1, CBIS2, CBIS3. CBIS stood for actually cardiac insufficiency bisoprolol studies. In all of them, we realized that bisoprolol was very well tolerated and came out with very good efficacy and safety in ischemic heart failure, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, when you look at the age groups in all of them, there is a significant benefit. When you look at the beta blockers in hypertension, you have two situations, uncomplicated hypertension treatment, and which is not associated with any other problems. Then you have hypertension, which is complicated by either arrhythmias or associated ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease or associated heart failure or increased sympathetic activity. In these situations, if you find a totally uncomplicated hypertension, uh, beta blocker usage could be minimal unless there is increased resting sympathetic overactivity. But once there is complicated hypertension, such as arrhythmias, coronary artery disease, heart failure, 100% of them will need a beta blocker. And when you look at the beta blockers across the cardiovascular continuum, how do they benefit? They help to mitigate many of the deleterious effects of sympathetic core activity. We know that in risk factors such as hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, 
There is associated sympathetic overactivity, atherosclerosis, left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary artery disease, myocardial ischemia, infarction, coronary thrombosis. Uh, also, those people who are subjected for non-cardiac surgery, there is increased sympathetic activities which may increase morbidity mortality. Beta blockers greatly reduce event rates. Those who have myocardial infarction, heart failure, there's a neurohormonal activation which can be blunted by beta blockade. In those with arrhythmias and loss of muscle who are vulnerable for sudden death, beta blockers offer maximum reduction in sudden cardiac death and also helps in remodeling uh, ventricular enlargement and reduce the chance of worsening heart failure and rehospitalizations. Now we have dealt with one arm of management of hypertension that is sympathetic activity. And now we come down to running angiotensin aldosterone system or called AC inhibitors or that is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker mechanism for protection of the kidney, renal protection. We know that in the Bowman's capsule, there's a glomerular crease, there's an afferent arterioles and bring the blood into the glomerular capillaries and then it goes out to the efferent arteriole. If there is a efferent arteriole, the blood coming through the efferent arteriole with the glomerular capillaries can increase the intraglomerular pressure that causes increased proteinuria and worsening of the kidney function. That increases the filtration and that leads to renal dysfunction. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are very efficient in de decreasing efferent arteriolar tone, thereby reducing intraglomerular pressure. That means if you dilate the outflow pipe, the pressure inside the glomerular capillaries decreases and that acts as a renal protective mechanism. This causes, in, although when you initiate, because you decrease the pressure in the glomerular capillaries, there could be initial drop in uh, EGFR, but it stabilizes and then it's associated with greatly decreased albuminuria because you're decreasing the pressure in the glomerular capillaries, eventually leading to renal protection. Among the ARBs, most commonly used is the telmisartan, a highly selective angiotensin 2, A2, type 1, AD1 receptor antagonist. Telmisartan provides effective reduction in blood pressure across the entire 24 hour dosage interval. When we know that angiotensinogen gets converted into angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 2, and this goes and acts on the AT1 receptor as well as the AT2 receptor, by giving telmisartan, we prevent activation of AT1 receptor through angiotensin 2. This leads to protection of sympathetic nervous uh, system stimulation, prevents vasoconstriction, prevents, reduces force of contraction in the heart, which helps in ischemic heart disease and heart failure, and also decreases sodium and water retention through aldactone, which is very helpful in heart failure. This also, which activation of AT1 would have led to increase in the blood pressure by blocking all these four mechanisms, the telmisartan blocking AT1 leads to decrease in the blood pressure. Since it does not have significant effect on the A82 receptor, which would have caused vasodilation, this vasodilation is left behind as a beneficial mechanism. So being super selective AT1 receptor is actually beneficial. Telmisartan is a long lasting blood pressure lowering effect and cardioprotective properties due to its strongest AT1 receptor antagonism ability and corresponding slower dissociation from the receptor. Several landmark trials such as on target, transcend, detail, MDO, Vivaldi have shown the effectiveness of tel telmisartan, means it has consistently reduced the blood pressure. In 2019, Indian Hypertension Guidelines recommends telmisartan as one of the drugs of choice for the treatment of hypertension. When you look at the treatment strategy for hypertension with specifically coronary artery disease, Initial therapy should be dual combination involving an ACRB plus a beta blocker or a cancel channel blocker. Or a cancel channel blocker with diuretic or a beta blocker or a beta blocker plus diuretic. So here, and 
beta blocker becomes the first choice with coronary artery disease, along with either an AC inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker, rarely a beta blocker. You can choose a monotherapy with only beta blocker if there's a very uh, low blood pressure. You use two drugs as fixed dose combination. If with those two blood pressure, blood pressure is not well controlled, then give them a triple combination therapy of all the three together, AC inhibitors, or uh, sorry, ARB, one of them, plus beta blockers and a calcium channel blocker, or ARB beta blocker diuretic, or calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, and diuretic. If it's not controlled, then you call it with three class of drugs, use at maximum tolerable dose. If the blood pressure is not controlled, then it's called resistant hypertension. Then you add spinal lactone, 25 to 50 milligram once daily or other class of drugs. So that is the way to be treated. ESC 2018, treatment strategy for hypertension with atrial fibrillation. Initial dual combination has to be an ACRB plus a beta blocker or a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker with calcium channel blocker. That's the first step. If you're not able to control or convert to sinus rhythm, then triple combination of ACRB beta blocker, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or a diuretic has to be used. The first Indian clinical trial, a randomized double bind plural group multicenter phase three, com comparing the efficacy, safety, and tolerability of fixed dose combination of telmisartan 40 milligram plus bisoprolol 5 milligram versus telmisartan 40 and metoprolol extended release 50 succinate. It was done in st stage one and stage two hypertension patients, multicenter randomized, as I said, total of 264 subjects. 10 centers across India. When you look at the change in blood pressure from baseline to 12 weeks, that is three months, the group A, which has uh, Telmisartan 40 and Metoprolol extended release 50, the change in the blood pressure was systolic was about 24 millimeters of mercury plus or minus one. In the group B, which is telmisartan and bisoprolol, had higher BP reduction mean change of 28 millimeters of mercury with a p-value very, very significant, less than 0.001. When you look at the diastolic, see the diastolic blood pressure difference in the group A, that is telmisartan 40 and metoprolol extended release 50, if the diastolic was reduced by 14 millimeters of mercury in the group B, that is telmisartan and bisoprolol, reduced by about 15, more than metoprolol. So this clearly tells us that isoprolol is doing a good job. The mean difference in seated systolic blood pressure from baseline to week 12 was better in telmisartan bisoprolol group compared to telmisartan metoprolol group. The trends of seated systolic blood pressure from baseline to end of study, that is 12 weeks, when you look at it, in the group A at the baseline, if the mean systolic blood pressure is about 154, by the end of 12 weeks, it came to 129. That's phenomenal control. When you look at the group B, which had telmisartan and bisoprolol, again, if it was 155 at baseline, it came down to about 127. And each of the stages also uh, are equally reduced by bisoprolol. The mean change in systolic blood pressure baseline to 12 group A and B was significant. Mean change of diastolic blood pressure, again, when you look at beginning to 12 weeks, um, you will see here that in the group A, that is telmisartan metoprolol started with 94 and reduced it to maximum of a minimum of 80 by the end of uh, 12 weeks. And again, in bisoprolol and telmisartan group started with 95 and ended at 80. So again, p-value very, very significant. So these beta blockers significantly reduced both systolic and diastolic blood pressures along with telmisartan. So the change in BP in subjects between 80 to 50 years group, you will see that in the telmisartan metoprolol group, if there is a 25 millimeters of mercury systolic reduction, 
with telmisartan bisoprolol it was 29 millimeters of mercury diastolic was almost similar in both the cases change in bp in 51 to 65 years when you look at the systolic again with bisoprolol as compared to metoprolol along with telmisartan gave you better systolic blood pressure control and also slightly more diastolic bp reduction 15 versus 13 when you use bisoprolol meto with telmisartan versus metoprolol with telmisartan when you look at the safety when you give efficacy alone is not important safety is also important no major adverse events were reported about 8% subjects reported mild or moderate adverse events and if it was 10.5 in tested, control had only 8.3. So that means almost negligible. None of the adverse events require discontinuation of treatment drug. Most events resolve completely. Laboratory results, such as you know, your blood sugar, creatinine, uh, lipids, vital signs, ECG, echo, or within acceptable clinical ranges in both arms at the beginning and at 12 weeks. Including today's discussion, the results of this randomized double-blind parallel group multicenter phase three clinical study established that fixed dose combination of telmisartan plus bisoprolol in group B was not only non-inferior to fixed dose combination of telmisartan and metoprolol succinate, but also proved to be superior in several endpoints, which were statistically significant. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends on the platform. And I open this to discussion along with uh, respected uh, um, chairman for today, Dr. Nagar Desai. Uh, thank you, Dr. Girish, for that uh, nice overview of the problem that we are facing in India, comparing to the West, and also bring forth the concepts of beta blockade in the management of uh, patients with hypertension, patients with CAD, patients with heart failure, and changing perspectives of the guidelines that are being uh, increasingly advocated not only from Americas, but also from Europe. And indeed, a combination pill that is the that is in vogue now uh, talks of uh, usage of combination pill proactively in patients with hypertension. Uh, most of the guidelines are recommending and also Indian guidance, guidance is no exception. With those remarks, in case there are any questions in the chat box, let's take them up. Let me just check the chat box here. Um, now, at the moment, there are no particular questions being raised in the chat box here. Now, let me just kind of um, say that in your clinical practice, in case as a kind of a opener, to kind of a uh, little inertia that may be there when we are recovering from, you know, uh, getting ready for questions here. Uh, what is, uh, how often when patient comes to your office, you start off with combination pill or would you really look at the monotherapy as an option first? What's your take? Um, in my practice, sir, if the systolic blood pressure has been less than 150 and less than I mean, more than 135 consistently. Very often, I may just start with one pill. But there are many patients who come with more than, uh, many patients who come with more than 160 and diastolic pressures of more than 95 or close to 100. I definitely start with two pills. And uh, if it's younger or associated cardiovascular disease or a heart failure, then it's always for me a uh, beta blocker with an um, ARB or an AC and RNA, that would be the choice. Fair enough. Now, I there's a question in the chat box here. They have specifically asked us to comment on, uh, you know, which beta blockers, who as a speaker, uh, what is your recommendation? What is your feeling about it? I think most beneficial beta blocker in heart failure. So they did not mention whether it's heart failure to reduce ejection fraction, or a preserved ejection fraction. For a moment, it is a reduced ejection fraction. Let's take it that way. That's the more prevalent, you know, let's uh, answer um, that. When I, when I look at it uh, at this point in time, I think uh, bisoprolol has for me become the primary choice uh, for great uh, titration availability. 1.25, 2.5, 5, 
and up to 10. And carotidinol is useful in some situation you also, where you also want peripheral vascular dilatation along with uh, beta blocking benefits, especially, you know, postpartum cardiomyopathy is one area where I still consider. But otherwise, I think today, uh, bisoprolol has superseded uh, metoprolol in my practice. Okay, fair enough. Now, do you, do you think that, you know, when uh, you are uh, evaluating the patient, would you like to look for heart rate as one of the targets in your practice? Because you discuss so many aspects of heart rate being beneficially affected by the beta blocker therapy. What is your take on that clinically? Yes. Um, I think, sir, this is one of the most under-recognized risk factor in the entire continuum, I fear. People have focused so much on just the systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure, but they have really forgotten about the cardiac output, which is the stroke volume versus heart rate. When you want to protect a heart, you not only treat the peripheral vascular resistance, looking at systolic and diastolic heart uh, blood pressure, but you also want to reduce force of contraction. You also want to reduce number of times heart beats. To me, in an ischemic heart disease, uh, means coronary artery disease and a heart failure, heart rate is a very integral part of therapy. And even in those who do not have coronary artery disease, as long as it does not cause excise fatigue, trying to keep the heart rate to the uh, lowest without causing discomfort would offer maximum benefit on long term. That's my understanding. In, in fact, you know, I just wanted to kind of push you and myself a little in a corner. What will be your heart rate uh, control in your practice? Is it 60 or is it 55 or is it 50? What's your uh, in a ballpark figure, for instance, when you want to educate your patient? Patients. Um, I would always want to be more than 60, but less than 70 is the ideal zone to be. I would not want to go below 60 uh, because, you know, when we examine, we are uh, in an awakeful situation. If it is 60, when they sleep, it could be very, very low. So I'm not very comfortable. So I would like to stay below 70, but definitely above uh, 60. Fair enough. If the patient comes to you with a heart rate or pulse rate of 55, how do you want to deal with it? Uh, while on beta blocker or without on beta blocker? While on beta blocker, certainly. And patient comes into your office. And I want to know from you, uh, what is your education that you would like to give it to the patient? Yeah. And kind of, these are things because I'm not able to get any questions in the chat box. I right. thought hypothetical uh, scenarios, yeah. yeah. That's right. Absolutely, sir. I think we oftentimes notice that today, uh, mostly youngsters or very elder have um, lower heart rates, you know, 55 uh, to 60, uh, sometimes even having hypertension. I'm surprised. Some of the young people, their heart rates are on the lower side, uh, but blood pressure is on the higher side. I think these are the ones who are most ideally treated with a calcium channel blocker or an, uh, what I call ACRB uh, diuretic pills and never touch a beta blocker in these people. And again, elderly people whose heart rates are less than 60, um, I'm very, very concerned because their stroke volume is fixed. It's not going to increase so much because of diastolic uh, stiffness or dysfunction. Only way they can increase cardiac output is by increasing the heart rate. And if there's blunting of the heart rate by a beta blocker, they would feel very easily fatigued or occasionally they could have syncope or posi uh, you know, positional uh, uh, hypotension. So young people, I try to avoid beta blockers. Elderly, I definitely don't give beta blockers if heart rates are less than 60. Fair enough. You are depending upon the not only patient profile, but also the heart rate or pulse rate to decide about the beta blocker uh, therapy. Now, in case you have to kind of up titrate beta blocker dose, does it happen with hypertensive patients also? Or you would like to go to the third uh, third drug in combination? Uh, I do not uh, had uh, started the uh, bisoprolol 2.5 milligram. Would you like to go to the 5 milligram? Or would you like to go to the third rack as an option? Because we are we have 
options here options to yeah. make this more uh, you know uh, the kind of fixed dose combinations have been really versatile i mean you can ask for anything today and it is available i do not push one drug to the maximum dose um try and get best of two or three class of drugs but there are some people who need higher dose of beta blocker because of predominant tachycardia in them i really push the beta blocker to achieve heart rate close to 70 and then definitely add an arb or a calcium channel blocker to get a blood pressure control because these are people who predominantly have sympathetic overactivity otherwise most other people i think a touch of you know two or three class of drugs with moderate dose it gives you a very sustained uh, blood pressure control without much side effects well that's a well said uh, you know in fact these combination pills of fdc like uh, beta blocker and telmisartan being available bisoprolol and telmisartan being available to us um, the third drug when you would like to add on will be always a clinical uh, question and it is all kind of driven by the clinical wisdom of the clinician but also by the patient's characteristics also now as i see as we are approaching 9 o'clock in case uh, there are no more questions uh, uh, dr desai there was there was one question on your views on deep venous thrombosis there is one question there oh sorry sir as this does not involve the yes. yeah. topic that is being discussed i okay. intentionally ignored it honestly okay let's not answer that question at this moment we can always get in touch with one another discuss this topic and uh, after having uh, heard uh, dr girish does he have any kind of a parting uh, uh, opinion or statement for the audience that he, that are that is listening to him dr girish please before i conclude thank you sir i think uh, take home message today i would like to tell them is uh, sympathetic overactivity is something to be very mindful of since india has many hypertensives who are in middle age and uh, when you have to choose a combination pill we know acrb is one of the most standard along with that bisoprolol today has added a good sustainable titrable dimension uh, we should consider it not only because of blood pressure control but also good heart rate control both in those with only hypertension as well as hypertension coexisting with coronary artery disease and heart failure thank you perfectly said uh, dr girish uh, namasundi uh, friends we had a good session of nearly one hour uh, kind of uh, overviewing the prevalence the complications especially with indians that we have here in patients with hypertension and its various varieties of comorbidities the combination pills will provide us an opportunity to manage our patients with the minimum pill burden and addressing the issue of uh, compliance in patients with hypertension mind you many a time patients with hypertension are completely asymptomatic a combination pill like uh, telmisartan and the you know bisoprolol combination is a well known a uh, combination pill that we should be you know considering in our practices and always we have to fall back upon clinical wisdom when we select the dose combination and when we enhance this combination therapy to a two pill or even three pill combination therapy now beta blockers have been repositioned as was mentioned by dr girish also in the management of hypertension in the recently released uh, 2023 guidelines by european society of hypertension so in other words beta blockers being there for such a long time in since 60s uh, they seem to have come back with a bang almost i would say uh, when we manage our patients with hypertension not only uncomplicated but also complicated way there are obligatory need for using you know beta blockers in our clinical practice have uh, with these uh, remarks i will thank once again dr girish for that wonderful presentation and on his own behalf and also my my behalf he has something to say go ahead dr girish i'm so sorry sir there's one late entrant who is repeatedly asking a question how would you treat isolated diastolic hypertension yes. can you just answer the gentleman we just go ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead with your permission 
Yeah. I just want to tell him, you know, the blood pressure is a product of heart rate, stroke volume, peripheral vascular resistance. People who tend to have diastolic blood pressure, hypertensive, sorry, what do you call predominantly diastolic hypertension, tend to have high peripheral vascular resistance and uh, less of uh, cardiac mediated, that is stroke volume or heart rate related. So these are the people who tend to benefit maximum with ERB, diuretic and calcium channel blockers and uh, less probably with uh, uh, beta blockers. That's my suggestion. Fair enough. Excellently said. And I'm glad that you pointed out and I did not uh, notice it. Thanks for that. And uh, Thanks once again, Girish, for clarifying that particular doubt. And indeed, uh, this is time for us to hand over the podium to the organizers who have done a good job. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harish Murthy, uh, and also the absent general. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desai. Uh, and it has been a wonderful one hour of deliberations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Navsundi. It was such a lucid presentation. Uh, you have placed before the audience a wonderful perspective of the combination of a beta blocker as well as an acid meter. And Dr. Desai, thank you so much you know, for moderating the session so well. In fact, uh, I would also thank all the audience who have come in, and I'm sure you must have got several good take-home points uh, from the one-hour deliberations. So I just would like to say that on behalf of Microlabs, uh, we thank all of you for having come. And would also like to mention that, you know, Microlabs was the first company to, to bring into the market a fixed dose combination of a bisoprolol and a telmisartan. Uh, we had uh, the brand name, of course, all of you know is BISO-T. In fact, we had done a clinical trial, which Dr. Navsundi uh, also spoke about, and uh, which was compared with the metoprolol, the combination, and we found it uh, much superior. So uh, it is available for your patients. And uh, thank you very much for having come. So well, with this, uh, uh, I think we should uh, uh, close the meeting and uh, uh, goodbye and good night to all of you. Thank you, Bye. doctors. Bye.